So the blurb uh, for the book, it talks a lot about the cover-up. The jacket copy? Of the story. Yeah. And uh, so that's not what it's about. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask because obviously it makes this big thing about the leaks and trusting yeah, the I feel government. Like, I feel like I'm getting dinged for that. Um, well, I think thematically that's what it's about. But it like, yeah, it's kind of like a Simpsons episode where it starts in like one place and then like veers in a very, very different direction. Um, I mean, it was kind of... It was, that was my call, like, I guess my, my deep, dark secret, because uh, I, I pretend, like, uh, I don't have any control over it, but the truth is I have <laughs> all of the control over it, um, because I wrote that into my contract that I had to be, if not in charge of the marketing, I had to sign off on all of the marketing. They can't do anything yeah. without my permission, and uh, I have to okay everything, and so I was, I wanted to push it in this, like, bury the lead, <laughs> bury the <laughs> shit out of the lead direction because I, uh, I, I I wanted to draw in an audience that might not think they're into that sort of thing. So it's kind of like come for the like government conspiracy, stay for um, this uh, bizarre story. <laughs> that, that was why I kind of, I also wanted it to like be as un, I know this sounds terrible, but like, ungendered like mm -hmm. um like because that was early on when they were like doing the cover it was like girly to the point where it looked like a middle grade like the first few covers i got back were very like is this for 10 year olds like <laughs> they were like <laughs> pink and purple and had oh god and i i was i had to we pushed it in this Saul Bass direction, like the marketing, because mm. so, I wanted it to be as like agender as possible. I didn't want it to look girly or masculine. I didn't want it to look like a thriller. I wanted it to look like sort of a vibe. And so I, I, I guess I, I pushed it in that direction because I think burying the lead would allow people to, you know, accept it on its own terms since it wasn't marketed as like, you know, the shape of water. <laughs> So one of the, the things that very quickly started jumping out at me was the relationship um, mm -hmm. between the two leads, um, Cora Ampersand. I thought that was great. And you'd spoken in some of your videos about misunderstood monsters and romances with monsters. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned Shape of the Water just then. Was that kind of story something that you've wanted to tell for a while? Is that a, yeah, a yeah. theme that No, totally. That was sort of in the earlier version of like the, the previous life of this book, it's like, that's what I wanted, but I was like total chicken shit about it. So um, <laughs> it it was just a much, like the, the emotional core of it was just really like buried and non-existent. So like the result in my opinion was just like w a story that was like way more boring, you know, and just p people doing things in a sequence, not because they're like emo motivated by any like emotions, but just because mm. like it's time to do the thing because the motivation said so. Um, and and so like it wasn't until uh, uh, it's honestly it was um, Kaylee Donaldson at uh, Pajiba was uh, tweeting about Shape of Water and this other graphic novel that came out around the same time. This was the end of 2018. And she was tweeting about like, like, oh, yes, our day has finally come. <laughs> Monster fuckers of the world <laughs> unite. <laughs> and like there's just this giant thread of just like people being like, yes. And I was like, huh. <laughs> that's, maybe that's what the kids are into um all right uh so that that was kind of what i guess gave me like the galvanized me to approach this story in the way that i had always wanted to but had been too cowardly to do in like in my 20s i guess <laughs> in my younger years yeah but also I, I i wanted to play it really straight you know i think that's the other thing that's what makes this really yeah challenging is because I didn't I didn't want it to be like a joke I didn't want it to be like looking at the camera but I also didn't want it to be just like this wild like where it's just like a hot boy <laughs> that, that says a monster sometimes because that's still really popular so I, I I just I don't know that was sort of like my personal challenge was like can I make this work for like not just people who are like already into that but like for a mainstream audience did you ever get any sort of pushback on that mainly because as opposed to things like Twilight or even Warm Bodies, where it's like, mm -hmm. they're a monster, but they're a hot boy. Yeah, they're hot boys. Ampersand is so <laughs> alien. Like, yeah, yeah. I wanted to push it like as physically alien as I could go without it being, I guess, distracting or unbelievable, right? Well, I mean, I guess it is fundamentally unbelievable, but like, you know, 
because I guess visually I like to think of him as like basically like this exact middle ground between like Geiger's xenomorph from Alien and mm. Eve from Wally. So it's like <laughs> whatever like whatever's the exact middle point is 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 where he lives. And uh, I don't know. I think that's the thing is like you don't you don't really see anything like that except side of movies weirdly because in books it does tend to be just like very conventional like they're almost always white they're always young yeah. they um usually have brown hair it's like a very specific look <laughs> um like i just read one where his flaw was he had a scar on his cheek but he was otherwise the sexiest boy that ever sexy <laughs> yeah and i just don't find that interesting i think it's just like it's yeah. a lot it's a lot more of a challenge <laughs> to like try to make this like you know like believable i guess because that's another problem i had with uh, the shape of water was there wasn't really a curve so like in, in the shape of water like the Elisa and the Fishman like just instantly like you know have a connection like they have yeah ET heart bond and um like there's no real like period of mistrust there's no like there's kind of like a learning about each other but it's always like in complete good faith so like their relationship doesn't really change as as the movie progresses and I think you know that that is more appealing to me in this type of narrative like any Beauty and the Beast story is you know it's like barely even friends then somebody bends like that's that's the appeal. <laughs> Were there any monsters that helped inspire Ampersand or played into your creation of him and the other aliens? Well the ironic thing is I'm sure this is coming down the pike, but like I had sold this book uh, like about a month after Bumblebee came out. <laughs> and um, I was, I, as I was watching Bumblebee, I was like enjoying the shit out of it because it's the only good Transformers movie, but I was also like, yeah. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> oh no, I'm going to get like accused of plagiarism because, you know, uh, <laughs> similarities are there <laughs> there are a lot of similarities but like from a character perspective i think it's like it is honestly kind of rare you know because you it'll be like in, in kids right like if there is a sympathetic monster character it'll be like you know et the iron giant and you know animated movies like that terrible bill parsons movie from dreamworks called home that starred rihanna and like mm. the only the only redeeming quality is that it starred rihanna so usually whenever you have like a, a genuinely like inhuman looking character it's for children's media and yeah like, they're like, like i think transformers is like this this weird outlier but it totally does that uh it doesn't do it well <laughs> but it tried i'm talking about the movies like other media does do it well um yeah. and then arrival kind of does it but i think the thing about arrival is like you know the aliens are still kind of like ideas more than like characters with personality you know they I think that's sort of the real trick is like crossing the line from almost being like a plot device to having a personality and having like understandable motivations that change over the course of the narrative. So I think honestly, like it's just something you don't really see. And I think that a lot of people were like, this feels like YA. I'm like, no, it really doesn't. <laughs> it feels like younger than that uh, because you don't see that sort of thing in adult media very often, but it really doesn't feel like YA because you never see anything outside of a hot white boy as, as the, yeah. as the, the love interest but no i can't say that he was like uh i mean i think they, obviously like it's in any fiction it's like it's kind of a reflection of the author so i think it, it's it's sort of he's sort of like that that part of myself that is really distant and self-contained and controlling and micromanaging like <laughs> and I guess fearful, you know, because I want I liked yeah. this idea of it being like sort of a mutual disgust, you know. I think that's something that you don't also see very often outside of like thought experiments on Tumblr, where it's like, okay, well, we assume that the aliens are scary and bad are here here to kill us, but what does the reverse look like? Like, what is potentially frightening about us? And so I, I feel like at least in the first half, a lot of his motivations are dictated by that. Yeah, definitely. I, I enjoyed how that, like, there's that moment where he mentions about her being a meat eater and it seems to freak him out. Yeah. <laughs> and realise he's just as scared of her. And seeing that change was, was great. It's, I'm going to have to post like a slight spoiler mm -hmm. thing if anyone listens to this, but the... <laughs> the the nesting scene yeah that, that's it's funny because that's what that's what we called it too <laughs> 
that moment where you realize he's figured out i don't have to be scared of her and she's having almost the same realizations and mm-hmm. i that's the point where it's like okay these characters are actually falling in love aren't they and i suddenly realized oh i'm starting to love this book <laughs> like oh it's one of those <laughs> i had so many of my friends like uh you know, sort of like that Arrested Development scene, like dead dove do not eat. It's like, well, I don't know what I expected from you. Like I had one friend straight up, like after she finished it, like DM'd me like, you sneaky bitch. You you wrote a monster boyfriend book. And I'm like, what did you expect? (laughs) Are there any like designs for Ampersand? I tried. I I had a really clear (laughs) image in my head and it's like, I feel like, you know, Lindsay's probably got a really clear idea what she wants him to look like and I don't know if my version's like that and I can't oh I promise you it's not drawing yeah yeah no I think think it's one of those things where it's like it's it's out there it's you know it's that's that's how prose works is you describe the thing and however somebody reads it is correct but there's no wrong to like read a description and visualize it but it was also kind of tricky because it's like the the, um for one thing i did hire a concept artist to help me like just get it down so i could have something to to work from to like when i'm actually describing uh not just ampersand but all like because you know there's like what 30 i don't know somewhere in there and and they're like roughly the same shape but different sizes um Hmm. and, and it was it was really hard because instead of like describing them the way I do in the book, I was just like pulling from visual, um, like this movie or this dinosaur or, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, it was just like this back and forth. I'm just like, man, this is really hard because it I kept not being correct. Uh, and, you know, eventually I kind of was just like, well, this is good enough. But like, cause my attitude is like, if like working with a concept artist, I could never get it quite right. <laughs> Um, I feel like it's always going to be like just this this wildly different thing in your head or anybody's head and that's fine it's not wrong you know it might not be what I had in my head but like it you know it's sort of like this death of the author thing where it's like I did the best I could if the descriptions were not vivid enough then that's on me. When I when I finished the book, this was one of the first books that actually like elicited quite a strong reaction in me. I, I like film or TV. I'll, I'll cry at the drop of a hat, yeah. but books it doesn't tend to do that. But mm-hmm. there was something about this story, and I realised after like sitting and thinking about it for days, was it's the way you wrote a quote monster who turns out to be a really kind person, and it's just the fear of the unknown, and that connected with me because like most of these stories as a minority Mm -hmm. you kind of get a lot of that in real life yeah and and people have that kind of reaction to you did you think about that kind of thing while writing it or is that just something that evolves in the process did you kind of make those connections yourself structurally like from the beginning um like because basically like a lot of the details and the way things go down changed over the course of you know revising this over however many years but the basic plot points especially like with regard to like their dynamic were were always kind of set in stone you know because I would see some reviews talk about how like Cora is this really unsympathetic character which strikes me as very odd because to me the thing that makes her unique like her defining moment is basically an act of compassion which happens towards the first third of the book and she doesn't really know can't really articulate why she does this thing but just yeah. kind of feels like I don't know it just seems like correct to seem like the right thing to do and and that sort of being the uh catalyst for what their how their relationship develops and you know basically it takes ampersand a while to see that for what it is let alone place any value on it because you could like from this outside perspective see it as basically this arbitrary decision but like the fact that it happens more than once and like the fact that this is helping you more than you know the reason you came here is uh you know i think i think it's it's that was intentional it was important and I think that it does make her somewhat unique where you see this thing that is fundamentally you know like you don't get it and in some ways you will never get it but you your instinct is to show compassion rather than aggression so that 
I, I guess is sort of that's sort of like I guess the the central core of their relationship is sort of like you know compassion versus fear and how that can in like you know obviously like in human relationships and in the way like groups of people relate to each other um i'm sure the answer is going to be no but are you able to sort of tease anything that might happen in truth of the divine or oh, man. where the character <laughs> might go um i well okay so i guess i had one friend kind of compare it to like into the woods act two <laughs> because effectively like the the second book is the w one i had in my head before the first one because basically the second book is about the fallout from the first one because like I, yeah. I, I don't know if this is like i mean this is kind of a light spoiler but like one thing i hadn't really seen done very often again except for transformers <laughs> is <laughs> How does society cope with the existence of first contact? The fact that it happened, like the world didn't end. Um, <laughs> that, you know, we still have to, you know, we have our economy, we have to get on with our lives. And, you know, for all we know, it's just like, well, this is just the world now. You know, you, you don't really happen. And then what I was interested in was, does this shape society? And that's part of why I wanted it to be an alternate history was because like, then we can almost sort of have fun tracking the way the two different timelines diverge. Yeah. I, I wanted to see or to tell a story that um, was just about that. Our society copes with this like existential change in our understanding of ourselves. And so in order to do that, I had to write the first one because I had to set it up. But like at the same time, it's also like fundamentally about the relationship of these two characters. So um, yeah, I guess the second one is is much more about like the societal fallout because that's another, you know, it's like it's in the background of the first book, but it's yeah. not really front and center. Like in the second book, it's much more front and center. These two have a fundamentally like impossible relationship <laughs> because they are so different and it's like really frustrating. And so like the difficulty of having this relationship with this other being is also very front and center so it explores that um, yeah it's, it's also a lot darker like the second content warning so <laughs> oh that's worrying because this one gets quite dark at times as well. oh really i see in my mind i was like oh this one's just like the fun one we <laughs> no <laughs> running oh. around <laughs> Th there was a moment towards the end where i almost put the book down thinking if this goes the way i think it's gonna go i can't finish this but luckily it wasn't that dark <laughs> <laughs> i did see one person that uh like one review that wished it had gone the way i think you think uh, you think you think you thought it was going to go um and someone was like ah, they it would have been you know a lot braver you should have you know this was like the coward's way out and i'm like man it's a, it's a five, i got five books come on <laughs> <laughs> Other than this series, do you plan to do more writing? Like, is there a chance commercial as fuck will come out at some no. point? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, okay. So like, I'll, it, it's, this is kind of a difficult conversation to have because it's like, you have to be careful what you say, but the, like, yeah. part of the issue with commercial as fuck was very like, stay in your lane. And I talked to, I actually did talk to my publisher about like, you know, having this other book and I was like feeling kind of iffy on it. And the only thing I told him about it was that the main character was uh, who was, or she was a woman of color who was also disabled. And he's like, I'm going to stop you right there. No. And <laughs> that was the end of that. He's like, I don't, you know, sort of like, I don't need to know anything yeah. else. The answer is no. Um, so we're in this sort of ecosystem right now and i'm not i to start like i don't want to claim to have the answers you know we saw this like you know big controversy around american dirt and who gets to tell whose story and you know when i was writing it like in 2016 2017 it's like it didn't really ping to me as like a bad idea but then like as time passed i kind of grew more and more uncomfortable with it because right now i think we are rightfully so in a phase where you know like hashtag own voices the yeah. people who are living these experiences should be in charge of who tells their own story and it also like dealt with some other like scientific things that are like also like an ethical minefield because it was near future and had, had to do with like genetic engineering that's the main reason why that one i don't think will be revisited anytime soon but i'm in talks with some other um yeah, i can't really announce it yet but some like more mainstream publishers to do some like licensed work with characters that are not mine Ooh, it, that's a very cool 
cool tease. I look forward to finding out what that might be. <laughs> yeah, we'll surprise you. <laughs> Whatever you're thinking, you're probably wrong. You'll be like, wow, I did not see this for you. Okay. <laughs> so you're not going to be writing the better sequel to Phantom of the Opera than Love Will Never Die? <laughs> Honestly, no joke. My co-writer Angelina and I have been just sort of like joking, not joking about this for years. Uh, I think I think we might have gotten scooped because like Netflix is they're they're doing like their Phantom mini series, but like you know we 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 constantly joking about how there is no good adaptation of Phantom of the Opera. The best we've got is the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical. So you know we would always talk about like how are we going to make this work? We should figure out a way to like make a Phantom of the Opera musical that or a Phantom of the Opera adaptation that is good and work because like we we've seen it done in fanfic. We know it can be done, um, <laughs> and you know it just. You know, we've just never started it, but we've been joking about it, you know, joking, not joking about it for years. But I'm like, well, maybe if this book does well, I'll be in like a, in a position where I can actually be like, hey, heard you like phantoms in your <laughs> phantom. <laughs> you... Have I, I've got a, I've got a pitch for a mini series starring Charles Dance. No. I guess because you're saying the, the second book mm -hmm. is exploring more the fallout and that's what initially drew, drew you to it. Is that the reason why book one is set? in 2007 did you have to sort of jump backwards to a point so that <laughs> the second one would be closer to the time you were coming up with the idea well the second one takes place in 2008 and that's why like i uh you know what like the, i have this thread of neologisms where i talk about like terms that didn't exist back then and i think people wrongly think in that thread i'm, I'm it's about axioms end and it, it's not it's about uh truth of the divine the second one no it was it was more just like an aesthetic thing uh and the fact that just the the idea of the story happening now in Trump's America is just it's to me more absurd than any of the alien shit that like <laughs> you know like because I think like the second Trump got elected people were you know like well we know there are no aliens because he would like, pull the lid <laughs> yeah. off that in like two seconds because it also like a lot of the background stuff that happens in this with regard to like the political fallout like keeping this thing secret is like it depends on like the assumption of like political decorum and uh you know honoring ideals just like because right now it's like we have a scandal every day like you just look back in the 90s where bill clinton got impeached for like a blow job and it's impossible to imagine that happening now so it needed to be at a time where there would be actual consequences for lying and i think people are so used to this concept aliens as a trope that it, it it's hard to appreciate just how much that would really shake society at least for a little while because i think like i think carl sagan oversold it <laughs> i think he was like this will just completely like change everything i'm like i don't know i think it would for a little bit but i think it would there would, it would settle back into new normal really quickly because that's just mm -hmm. that's just human history that's just what happens but yeah i i it just it so it, couldn't, it couldn't happen now. Like after 2016, everything just psh, <laughs> dashed, <laughs> dashed on the sidewalk. Is there anything that you changed along the way from previous drafts or anything like that where you kind of regret losing something from the story or there's an older version that would interest you still? Really? Yeah, because I think the, the like axiom, haha, kill your darlings, I don't agree with that. I think it's like, it's only your darling when you write it, but then if, you, if it needs to go, you realize it does. Although there is one, there is one exchange in this that I like, I'm definitely gonna, like, I have to cut it. But like, uh, are you familiar with Chris Fleming? He's a he's a YouTube comedian. Uh, no, no, I've not seen them. Oh, you, uh, so if you're a Phantom of the Opera fan, just Google um, Chris Fleming Phantom of the Opera docks his boat for the winter. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he, he does stuff like that. Uh, and I had a I had an exchange that was just like an extended quote from that video. <laughs> and I was like, this is the fun shit. And like people, you know, the, the 10 people who get this are going to like, oh, it's a real snake. Knee slapper that. But I had to cut it. So like little things like that, where it's like if the scene doesn't work and there'll be like a line or two that I had to cut, that'll be kind of a bummer. But like in general, nah. I think a lot of the shape of it was just like at first, you know, coming up with just this hypothetical civilization and like a, an evolutionary history for them and why their languages are there and like how their physiology influenced what their, you know, what we would call transhuman or posthuman, mm. like the alien version of that might look like. And 
you know, I, I, in earlier drafts of the book, I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about motivation, especially like on Ampersand's part, like, well, what was he doing like <laughs> during this month or so uh, before he enters the narrative proper? And like, why was he doing it? How do you feel about it? How does he feel even being here? And, you know, I think it's, it's much richer for it, for having like thought of all that and really working in biases. Cause it's like, well, being human, we don't really think of like, well, what would an anti-human bias look like? Like really? Really? Like, because like a lot of times it'll be like, you're inferior, but the narrative doesn't ever really explain why. Like, you're just, you just are, you know? Yeah. But like, for him to have like really concrete reasons to feel this way, that makes sense, you know? Especially, it's like if you are descended from like, herbivores the idea of like yeah. omnivorous alien would be horrifying and also just like if you are descended from like like just that are not as like jealous or competitive because i think like if you take a step back our competitiveness is why we have advanced so quickly and see where that would seem really like terrifying to outside eyes if that's not a value you hold as a good thing when you were developing the the alien race and sort of think about their backstory you mentioned in the book there are three spacefaring uh-huh. races and two of them get explained do you i'm not saying to give answers <laughs> but do you do you know what the third one is or did you just leave that as something that you could come back to later if you needed it yeah i i, I think the third one is like i know what it is there well i mean he describes them as post-biological and then just kind of leaves it at that a lot of it is based on like science fiction about like future humans and you know speculation on like where we might go so effectively like we had like this ancestral species that like sh- broke off and had like a shit million <laughs> attempts at uh, you know, establishing a civilization uh of which three have survived you know hominids almost like you know for a while we a few like <laughs> a few uh, human species and then you know, the last ones died out really recently and it is in you know like hmm, it's kind of sus right this <laughs> is like where you know it's like weird that we're the only ones huh okay cool i'm sure that's normal and not rooted in violence at all but yeah i think it's if you know and obviously it's one of those things where if it feels like setup it's because it is yeah this the sister species we will meet eventually because they are very very heavily foreshadowed in this one <laughs> other than ampersand are there any of the amygdalins who jumped out at you as favorites of yours who you enjoyed writing or might be looking forward to writing more of if they come back um, there, there's a new main character in the second one who was mentioned once <laughs> in the first one, uh, offhandedly and very, very uh, quickly. And I think that one will, I, I hope that one will be like a favorite with readers. It sees a lot more, I guess, eccentric than, than any of the other ones. But I guess because people, you know, it's like Woodward and Bernstein. So the people really like them, even though yeah, they're barely I, I there. They were cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, I, I like Esperus, but like, because I, I know what his deal is and the reader doesn't. So I guess that, that'll be a thing that gets explored in in lyrics. In your YouTube video where you talked about the process of getting published, you said about how sometimes people assume having a platform can help and how it didn't mm-hmm. sort of help in the early stages. Did you ever consider doing something like publishing under a pseudonym to separate your YouTube side from your writing so that it couldn't be like connected or influenced? Basically what my agent told me, and I think this turned out to be true, is no publisher is going to buy your book if they would not have bought it anyway, at least at, at my size. It's sort of like, you know, it has to be good enough to stand on its own. But if you have a platform, they might give you more money. And that I think has like basically turned out to be true. So I, I, I don't think that would help, um, at least like it, for this sort of thing. Like, I think the only reason to do that is if you, um, you're just like trying to create a completely different brand and your established audience yeah. would not be interested in the thing that you're working on. But I think the thing is like, it's, it's, it doesn't really help because it's getting to a point more and more that publishers kind of assume you need a platform, like even a modest one. Like it's, yeah. it's becoming a little more and more of a prerequisite that like five years ago, that was not the case for fiction writers, but it's, it's becoming more and more just the norm. So when I say it didn't help, I think what I meant was it didn't really help because they assume that's 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 what you need to get your foot in the door yeah. nowadays. You might not be able to answer that because you mentioned you've got something possibly in the works, but 
if you could write in any universe, if you got the opportunity to sort of dip in and, and contribute to a franchise you love, is there one that you'd go for? Transformers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tra- tra- <laughs> 10 out of 10. Tra- definitely Transformers. Because obviously you can never plan for where opportunities will come from, but... Mm. Like, I feel like that's the only one where I, 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 like, know the universe well enough that I would feel comfortable being like, we. Do you, it might be a cliche question, but do you have any advice to anyone who, who might be trying to do something similar and wants to get into writing? Um, it, yeah, it's funny because, like, every time I do, people get disappointed. I'm just like, because <laughs> it's never fun stuff. It's always like, no. you know, you don't need advice on the fun stuff. You already know what you like, but you just got to get really comfortable with rejection. And I found that the only way I could move forward with it was to just get really comfortable with the idea that this might never happen. For the longest time, it was just like, you have to prioritize other things or you're going to resent the shit out of the fact that people aren't reading your work the way you want them to. And just you just have to be okay with the fact that like you might be the only person who ever gives a shit. And that the truth, that's the truth. Like most people who try to get published won't, you know, it's we're not doing anybody in any, any favors by pretending that's not the case. And I think the, the other truth is like some people get really hung up on these like extreme outliers of people that like get like a six figure, seven figure book deal, yeah. like right out of college, you know, like uh, Tomi Adeyemi or uh, Veronica Roth. Cause so it's like people are like, well, it does happen. So they'll get really disappointed when your first try doesn't sell or your second try or your fifth try. And also it's just like, I genuinely believe you cannot write to the market. The only way to stay sane is to just accept that like it might not happen this time and it might never happen. You might just be way too into like a niche thing, uh, you know, and cause a lot of time it genuinely is not your craft and it's impossible mm. to tell too. Like, cause like that's the other dark secret about like mine when it, cause like um, when I was querying it last summer it was very tepid querying too i didn't i didn't query i think it queried like 10 agents and all of the ones who requested kind of came back with like i don't think i can sell this which is really funny and (laughs) because it's sold in a week which is for you know which is really fast for you know those that are (laughs) usually like for a debut author it takes months but like the issue was in the end it was Cora's age because in the draft the draft first draft that my um uh agent read she was 18 because and I was also like actually in college so I I changed it to like she's a she's a dropout and temping which I also felt very like embodiment of that era (laughs) just hopeless so we aged her up to 19 and then in the end aged her up to 21, which again, I, I, I'm i glad we did that for a lot of reasons, uh, especially in the second book where I can do all sorts of things that I couldn't do if she was only 18. But like, it was just, it was like literally this three-year age difference was the difference between like not being able to get an agent and it selling in a week. So that really is just kind of arbitrary that, you know, agents didn't look at this and be like, that, that was my what my agent, he was just like, the people are going to be a little squidgy about this because it feels a little YA curious and the tone of it, the genre is, is it's a little too borderline, but that's a really easy fix. And it was, and it just, in hindsight, it's just bonkers to me that nobody saw it that way. Like nobody was like, Hey, let's just change this thing. And then the, you know, the genre borderline is no longer a problem. Yeah. I guess I'd, I'd never thought about the age thing making such a big difference but certain books just get lumped into being YA when they're not because the characters are a certain age right yeah things like that like it is a marketing term but like because like it's like what is YA I'm like it doesn't really matter because it doesn't mean anything it's just a marketing term but it matters to publishers because they obsess over this sort of thing and they don't want to have to be like pushing this thing that is in the wrong category and that's another thing I did that was just like focusing more on like the political angle to make it feel more adult was you know because like all of that was there in the earlier draft but it kind of got played up and like what happens when and stuff like that my point with all of that is it's it's really hard to tell how much of it is you needing to improve your craft and how much of it is Mm. agents not thinking they can sell your work if this got picked up to be like adapted into a film or television is there like who do you think might be the best person visually to capture what you've done like from a directorial point of view i don't know um because i i I was like i'm not selling it as a film 
like full stop. I, I it's like, it's, it's, this was a conversation I had because we do have a film agent and I told them, I'm like, it's TV or nothing. Mm. I, I don't trust film anymore. I think it is way too sprawling to work as a, as a two hour film. Yeah. I think television would afford a lot of opportunity to actually spend time with all of the stuff that happens off screen. Cause there's like, in, since, you know, you have one point of view character, there's a lot of stuff that happens off screen that um, I, I feel like television would afford the opportunity to actually expand on that and make the world feel like that much more realized. You know, cause right now, like uh, Cora's father, Nils, he doesn't actually engage in the narrative. He's almost kind of like this God figure that like is sort of dictating the events of the book from across the ocean. You know, but I think in in a in a TV show, you you would be able to like actually spend time with him and see like where he's getting his information and like how what his machinations actually are and like what his plans are and like you know actually introduce new characters altogether. So yeah, like that that would be my thing. But I also like I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> <laughs> see, that is a like ignoring the fact that we are in a plague year. Streaming yeah. <laughs> television is a bubble. It is about to burst. So I'm just like, if I could just sell the option and make some quick and easy money off of it for <laughs> literally nothing, that would be nice. <laughs> I'm I'm sure you will because I'm I'm imagining this is going to be a really big hit when it comes out. Because you think, <laughs> yeah, like, like yeah maybe, honestly, I, I to... <laughs> you know, I I read a lot. I've I think I'm up to like 150 books this year so far. Oh wow! This is the <laughs> only one where I was like I finished it and was like if I didn't have other deadlines that I need to meet for reviews I'd have picked it back up again and it, it really means a lot great. so I I think once it gets out there in the public's hands they're gonna adore it oh thank you I, I look forward to like because that's the thing like right now it's all just like you know Kirkus reviews and stuff like that and I'm just like can we just skip to the discourse like <laughs> like it was just can we let's skip this phase let's let's go to discourse where you like do you do do the, the theories and and like you know is this problematic stuff like that <laughs> that's what i'm here for i won't engage in it though i'll be i'll be i'll behave i promise <laughs> can't promise i won't read it <laughs> although i'm not supposed to read fan fiction boy imagine if we got to that because like that that was like lisa my uh um uh you know web meister she was like oh my god there's gonna be so much fan fiction and i'm like I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> the, the the fan fictioner has become the fan fiction me. Yeah, I, I can totally see a lot of fanfic around the romance in this book. Yeah. Well, I'm just like, go as squirrely as you want, kids. I can only promise I will try to catch up. Thank you for, for coming on and answering these questions. I hope everyone who's listened has enjoyed it. And I found it really enlightening to learn more about the book. Thanks a lot. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me.